Welcome to Citizen Crusader Reviews. My name is Scott, and we're here with the Canik TP9DA. The TP9DA is a full-size polymer frame pistol, probably not something that your average person would select as a concealed carry option, but does this firearm stack up against its competition for a home defense or a service duty size firearm? Today on Citizen Crusader Reviews, we'll find out. Feature-wise, the Canik TP9DA is a polymer frame stainless steel slide. The slide does have some sort of a nitron, nitride-like coating on it, and we have a cold hammer forged carbon steel barrel. It is a striker-fired pistol, but still available in a single action and double action operation mode. We'll talk more about that in a minute. The sights on this particular firearm are Warren Tactical Combat Sights. They have a very narrow rear notch. That rear notch is great for picking up the front sight to let you know that you are absolutely on target. It's a more precise sighting system. This is great for longer range, range shooting. Maybe not the best option for defensive shooting. Typically in defensive sights, we would prefer to have a larger notch and a larger front sight dot to fill it. That's typically the way we go about getting a faster sight acquisition whereas the Warren tactical sights on this particular TP9DA are more of a precise shooting configuration. I have this against the, the rear sight has this sort of a ramp to it. For one-handed manipulation of this firearm, I have found that this likes to slip off the belt. It can be done, but it really doesn't play nicely with that technique as much as we would like. Other sights offer better a flatter surface there that you can hook it on the belt for that one-handed manipulation. The Warren Tactical Sights on this particular TP9DA, they, they, they don't really make it as easy for you as we would like. Let's talk a little bit about what else is in the box if you buy a TP9DA. The firearm comes with a holster and a magazine loading assist device. It includes cleaning utensils, a, a brush, and a trigger lock, of course, which you would expect on any firearm, in fact, that's required by law. I am strongly biased against holsters that come with firearms. Almost invariably, and until somebody shows me otherwise, I'm going to keep saying this. The holsters are really there just to check a box to attract new shooters. That holster is not a quality holster, and I would not recommend carrying this firearm in the holster that comes with it. What I would rather see Canik do is to take that cost out of the package, give me a third magazine, because it already comes with two, or just lower the cost. One of the things that the Canik TP9DA has going for it, the purchase price of these firearms is outstanding. These firearms can be had for under $400 new. That's an unbeatable value. Clearly, this is a quality firearm with a lot to offer at that price point. But if Canik is going to put a holster in the box, either give me one that's actually worth it, or better yet, bring the cost down even more and let me pick my own. The big story with the TP9DA is this trigger, and there's a lot going on there. It's called the DA because it's a double action firearm, but it's not just a double action firearm. It's double action and single action, which means that at times you get a nice, long, heavy, double action style trigger pull. Very familiar for anyone who's fired a double action revolver or most hammer fired semi-automatic pistols. That long, heavy trigger pull is followed by a much lighter, single action trigger. Notice a very short reset there, and then she's ready to shoot again. And one thing I'll say about the trigger in the TP9DA, that reset is nice. You get a very short reset, and it's right at the break. There's no take up again before the firearm is again ready to shoot. That's great. What I maybe don't like about that so much is that the trigger has several different behaviors. And even when it's in single action mode like this, if we release it, we come all the way out, the reset moves quite a ways forward, and then we're in double action mode again. But if the slide is moved even slightly to the rear, this effectively puts the gun back into single action mode, even with the trigger all the way forward. Moving the trigger, we have a very quick, light take up, and the trigger's smooth, it's not notchy or gritty at all. 
then it moves back, and then we get back to our ready to fire position as a single action trigger. This is strange. We don't like firearms that present such a changing trigger experience to the shooter. We like consistency in the defensive option. And for the average shooter who's going to keep a gun like this bedside, or maybe keep it holstered as they move it from home to vehicle and vehicle to home, I would much rather see a firearm with a more consistent presentation to the shooter. I think that you would have to train with this gun quite a lot and put a lot of rounds down range in a lot of different situations before you were really fully attuned to all of these different presentations. Again, there are three. We have single action, we have double long double action, and then even after single action, when we're in the single uh, the even after double action, when we're in the single action mode. If the gun moves the slide slightly to the rear, the trigger pops out, and then we have this take up to get back into single action mode. There's too much going on. It's too complicated. Now let's complicate matters even further with a decocker. Early Canic firearms had a much larger decocker button. You'll see in the TP9DA, it's a smaller button and it only exists on the left side of the pistol. This was following many user complaints about how large the decocker was. But now in the TP9DA, not only do we have three different trigger presentations, but we have a button that will move from one to the next. It takes it out of single action and back into double action mode. This firearm's own owner was unclear whether the firearm would still fire if it was loaded and the decocker had been pressed. That answer is absolutely yes, it will. If the firearm has a round in the chamber and the trigger is pulled after pressing the decocker, you have not unloaded the firearm. You have not disabled the firing mechanism. All you've done is move it from single action into double action. That's a lot for a new shooter to keep track of. That's just too much to keep in your head in a defensive use situation for a firearm like this. I don't like it. Um, there are other advantages to this gun. There are a lot of things that it does quite well. In particular, the slide stop. This is a, it is a non ambidextrous slide stop. It's only on the left side of the firearm. And at a glance, you can see that it sits very flush along the side of the pistol. This is good. You, you would never accidentally engage this. It's not going to catch on anything. It's nice and recessed. It looks like it would be difficult to manipulate, but it's really not. I found that while I expected the firearm to be difficult to lock open, it really pops right open. It doesn't take a lot of thumb force upward to engage it. It plays nicely. We appreciate that. But at a glance, it sure looks like it would be hard to use. It's not. Uh, disassembly for this firearm is both a, an advantage and a disadvantage. To disassemble it from double action mode, well, from single action, look at this. I'm struggling trying to figure out what mode this thing is in. So it's in double action mode now. We're going to press the decocker, and that will drop the striker, move the, the sear out of the way. And now all we have to do is pull down on the disassembly notches, the, these little controls, one on either side, and they do both have to be pulled simultaneously, and the gun comes apart. If the firearm is in single action mode, we can hold the trigger back and pull those notches down, and the firearm will disassemble. If the firearm is in single action mode, are you keeping track of all of this? If it's in single action mode and it's ready to fire, pulling down on the disassembly notches will not pop the slide off. Again, this is a lot to keep track of. On the one hand, we could say that if you're going to disassemble the firearm, always press the decocker first so that you don't have to pull the trigger. We like firearms that come apart without having to pull the trigger because as many will be aware, accidents with firearms, accidental discharges, etc., usually happen when the firearm is about to be maintained. So long as we can get the gun apart without pulling the trigger, that's great. I think that the TP90A just puts too many different scenarios in front of the user to keep track of what's going on with the firearm. Newer shooters will find this to be confusing, and where there is confusion, there's the opportunity for catastrophic error. The magazines are excellent. These are Metgar magazines. These are Italian-made. These are the same magazine manufacturers used by Smith & Wesson for all of the M&P and Shield firearms. Metgar magazines are top-notch. These are good magazines. And one way that the TP9 really crushes competition is in capacity. 18 rounds. The only firearm in this form factor that I'm aware of that carries more is a Springfield XDM with its 19-round magazines. However, that firearm is even a bit bigger still than the TP9DA. 
If you're looking for a full size, a duty size, home defense, personal defense firearm, the TP9 really is in that right form factor. My main concern with it is all this stuff going on with the trigger that we've talked about already. But quality magazines will feed the gun. The grip texturing is both, uh, I would say, positive and negative. You'll see that there are these pointy pyramids protruding from the removable back strap. By the way, you can adjust the grip diameter of this firearm and the same checkering in the front. However, on the sides, on this, these kind of side panels, we see something much more reminiscent of the Gen 3 Glocks. And even Glock admitted that the Gen 3 gun was too slippery as seen in the advancements made in the Gen 4 and Gen 5 grip. I think that this could be better. I don't know that you would lose your grip on this firearm if your hands were wet or hopefully not bloody, but the firearm isn't doing as much as it could for you to help you hang on to it. The firearm has a striker status indicator. I think we'd need some indicators on this thing to keep track of what all's going on with it. In double action mode, you'll see that the striker status indicator is not present. This is what had confused the owner of this particular firearm into thinking that it was not ready to shoot. However, just by popping the slide to the rear ever so slightly, we'll see the striker status indicator now protrudes from the rear. This indicates that the firearm is now in single action mode and will fire with a light trigger press. Important to note, even if you don't see the striker status indicator, the TP9DA will still shoot. That's a lot to keep track of for a new shooter. As a full-size, duty-size firearm, this firearm is not light. She comes in right around 28.8 ounces, very much on par with a Smith & Wesson M&P 9mm. However, the Smith & Wesson M&P doesn't hold 18 rounds in its magazine. I believe it only holds 15, maybe 16. Memory escapes. So weight-wise, I think that the firearm is where it should be for what it offers in its size. Uh, compared to a SIG P226, which comes in empty at 34 ounces, compared to Glock 19 at 23 ounces. It's right in between those, and that's what we'd expect. Lots of extra capacity, though, and we like capacity for home defense guns, for outside waistband, duty-type carry. The TP9DA also has a three-position standard M1913 style Picatinny rail. This enables compatibility with all of the accessories you would expect to find on the market, like lights and lasers. There's no proprietary rail system here. Hi Mike's Volcanic for keeping it right in line with the rest of the industry. Really, at the end of the day, my main complaint with the TP9DA is the fact that it's DA. I don't understand why a defensive pistol like this, a polymer-framed, striker-fired pistol, needs to be both double action and single action. Back in the day of early hammer-fired defensive pistols, it made more sense to have a double action, single action option as compared with the single action only competitors of the day. If you had a firearm that on a click and no bang misfire could just pull the trigger again to strike the primer a second time, this made sense. Decockers on hammer fired firearms made sense. It was a way to safely lower the hammer and put the gun back into a more safe, although still loaded condition. In a striker fired polymer frame modern pistol, this seems like needless convolution. When we look at other firearms in this same class, like the Smith & Wesson M&P series, the Springfield XD series, anything from Glock, we just don't see these complicated back and forth behavior trigger mechanisms. And it just seems like it's too much for the new shooter to manage, maybe even too much for veteran shooters to manage. So at the end of the day, I think I have to give the Canik TP9DA a Dangerous number. This is not a firearm that I would recommend for personal defense carry. I don't have any doubt that the firearm is functional. I take no issue with its material construction. I take issue with the decisions that were made in its design in all of the different modes that it presents to the user. I think that it's just too much going on. I do like the 18 round capacity. Sight radius is fantastic. The Warren Tactical Sights give a great sight picture, although they don't quite play nicely with one hand and manipulation as well as we would like. I think this is a good gun as a range shooter. I think that it's just too complicated to put into the hands of your average defensive user, which is, of course, who we're speaking to here on Citizen Crusader. If I had to ask Canik to make me a gun, I would ask them for a TP9 DAO. Give me a double action only variant of this firearm that does not have the decocker and does not have these different trigger behaviors. Give me a gun that has the three controls that I want, a trigger, a magazine release, 
and a slide stop. I will say that the, the TP90A with its reversible, easily reversible magazine release, that's a nice feature, but it's just too little too late. I, I think that this is not a gun that I'm gonna recommend. Finally, we'd like to thank Mark Bogner from Ridge Tactical Supply in North Ridgeville, Ohio, for providing this particular TP9DA. Please find Mark and Ridge Tactical Supply at ridgetacticalsupply.com. And the last thing I'm gonna say about the Canik TP9 applies to every Canik product. And unfortunately, we have to address the politics of the day. The current Turkish regime has been unacceptably hostile to its own people, to its neighbors, and to its fellow NATO allies. I have a serious moral issue with sending any money to Turkey for any products right now. Until the situation with Turkey's behavior in the world as a world citizen changes, it's unconscionable to me that we would accept their behavior and reward it with international business. I understand that can be a divisive statement, and this may or may not have the same weight for you as it does for me. But uh, in, until Erdogan is no longer running Turkey, and until Turkey really acts like a NATO ally and has the correct human rights protections, the quality of life for women, and behaves correctly with its neighbors in the region, especially Syria, it is not acceptable to me that we would purchase Turkish-made products. That's not a dig against the firearm. We've made several claims for and against the firearm based on its own merits, but we have to address where it's from and who's benefiting from its sale. We're on the range with the Canik TP9DA. We have a full magazine, 18 rounds of SIG defensive hollow point ammunition. We're gonna go ahead and load up the TP9DA, put some rounds down range and see how it does our first range shooting, our first range testing with this particular firearm. Things that we expect. We expect a nice, long, heavy trigger pull for that first double action shot. We expect the firearm to transition into single action there forward. I'm also going to stop in the middle of the string of fire, activate the decocker, and go back to double action to show that transition on the fly. Let's see how it does. That trigger reset is fantastic. If you find a better trigger reset than the TP9DA, please put it in the comments below. So we've pressed the decocker, the firearm has gone back to its double action mode, we're effectively starting over. You would do this in the case where you've been shooting and now you need to move. You need to be able to relocate your position, move the firearm somewhere in your gunfight, and you'll wanna be able to do that or holster the firearm again in that double action mode so that it's not so prone to fire when it's in single action. Notice how the trigger is well forward right now. That's our cue that we're back in double action. Also, if we look at the striker status indicator, there's no indication there that this gun is ready to fire, but it absolutely is, which we will now demonstrate. a smooth operating firearm. Even though it has a rather high bore axis, it's not really wanting to jump around on us too terribly much. I can feel the gun wanting to jump a bit, but it's got enough mass behind it that the recoil impulse is well manageable by the shooter. We've got a good two-handed strong grip, and of course I'm an experienced shooter. I'm having no problem at all keeping this firearm comfortably on target between shots. We'll go ahead and finish the magazine. We had one get away from us there, it went a little high to the right. Happens. Okay, so we're ready for our next magazine. This time we're shooting American Eagle 115 grain full metal jacket. Uh, we saw that the firearm handled just fine with those SIG hollow point defensive rounds. Let's see how it does with some FMJ. Doing fine so far. So we're gonna go ahead and drop that 
that decocker button to transition this back into a double action mode and get that nice long heavy trigger pull just for comparison. We'll do it again. I find that on that long pull I'm wanting to upset the firearm just before the trigger breaks. I also find that the firearm doesn't give much feedback for where that trigger break is in the double action mode. It's there but it's very subtle. It's very easy to pull right through the brake without knowing where it is. Yeah, it really doesn't give any indication at all that it's ready to fire. It's, it's very slight. Uh, I, I think that that would be hard to train your way into being comfortable with all the time. In single action, no complaints at all. She's definitely good to go in single. Right, we have an empty gun. For some reason, this firearm did not lock open on that last round. We don't know why that is. It's not typically a problem I have when operating defensive pistols, but you saw it. So just some last notes about the Canik TP9DA. I've had a lot of negative things to say about it, but this gun is not without its merits. I don't think that it's a great option for a new shooter, and I don't think that it's a great option as a defensive carry pistol. However, if you're looking for a firearm to practice with, a firearm you can take to the range and know that it's going to be a good gun for getting you on target at considerable distances, the TP9DA does have its merits. I think that Canik has given us a competent firearm. I think that uh, it's just not one that I could recommend to be your defensive carry pistol. If Canik could give us that TP9DAO, give us some more consistency in the trigger and take this extra decocker control out of the firearms package at this price point, I think it'd be a very competitive product. And until that gun exists and all we have is a TP9DA and it's SF and SFX uh, stable mates, I'm going to have to give it Deus Nope.